Dear students, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we are going to learn about heart failure. Heart failure, as the name itself says, means that the heart fails to do its job, which is to pump enough blood into the body to meet the needs of the body. Usually, it is a result of the heart becoming too weak or too stiff. When we talk about the heart becoming too weak, we refer to the heart can't pump hard enough, which means that it has affected systolic function. So, we have systolic heart failure. And when we talk about the heart becoming too stiff, we refer to the heart is not able to relax efficiently to receive the blood that is coming from the body, which means that it has affected diastolic function. So, we have diastolic heart failure. Because the heart received less blood, less blood is pumped out into the body. So, in both cases, the heart cannot pump enough blood into the body to meet its needs. Depending on which ventricle is affected, we can have left-sided heart failure, right-sided heart failure, or biventricular heart failure when both ventricles are affected. Each of them can have systolic or diastolic heart failure. To understand how these conditions affect the patient, we must have a great knowledge of the physiology of the heart and the pathophysiology behind heart failure. Okay, so first about the systolic heart failure. The systolic function of the heart is presented with the cardiac output, which is the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart each minute. The cardiac output depends on the contractility of the ventricle, the preload, which is the amount of blood that the heart received, the afterload, which is the pressure that the heart must work against to push out the blood during systole and the heart rate. Mathematically, the cardiac output is the product of the heart rate, the number of heartbeats per minute, and the stroke volume, which is the volume of blood pumped from the ventricle with each beat. The contractility, the afterload, and the preload affect the stroke volume. For a healthy individual weighing 70 kilos, the cardiac output at rest is around 5 liters per minute. Assuming a heart rate of 70 beats per minute, the stroke volume would be approximately 70 milliliters. Now, since the patient with heart failure fails to pump enough blood into the body, means that we have low stroke volume. So, we have low cardiac output which is the main feature of heart failure. But, because the cardiac output cannot be measured clinically, ejection fraction is the used index to estimate the systolic function. Ventricular ejection fraction is the volume of blood pumped out of the heart during systole, or stroke volume, relative to the total volume of blood that the ventricle received during diastole, which is the end diastolic volume. Normally, the total volume of blood that the ventricle receives is around 120 milliliters. And if normally the heart pumps out 70 milliliters, we get an ejection fraction of around 58%, which is in the range of normal ejection fraction. Now, in individuals with systolic dysfunction of the heart, the heart pumps less than 70 milliliters, which will lead to a reduced ejection fraction. Let's say the heart pumps less than 50 milliliters, or around 48 milliliters, which gives an ejection fraction of 40%. Ejection fraction of less than 40% means that the patient has systolic heart failure. Now, in individuals with diastolic dysfunction, the ejection fraction of the ventricle is normal. How is that? Well, the impaired relaxation of the ventricle 
leads to impaired filling with blood, which means that the total volume of blood that the left ventricle received is reduced. Perhaps, if the ventricle received 80 milliliters and pumped 48 milliliters, the ejection fraction will be 60%, which is in the normal range. From everything explained till now, we can distinguish heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, previously known as systolic heart failure, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, previously known as diastolic heart failure. Clinically, this is so important because the two types are treated differently. But what they both have in common is reduced cardiac output. When the cardiac output is reduced, meaning when the heart fails, many adaptations occur to support the heart function. The most important among the adaptations are the following. The Frank Starling mechanism, in which the body attempts to increase the preload to increase the cardiac output. The activation of the sympathetic system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And at the end, myocytes hypertrophy, alterations in that, and regeneration. Let's see how the Frank Starling mechanism initially supports the heart function. Well, since the stroke volume is reduced, the amount of blood that is left within the ventricle increases. Because of this, the ventricle fills with more blood, leading to an increased end diastolic volume or the total volume of blood within the ventricle before the ventricle contracts. Because of that, the myocytes stretch more. The more the muscle cells stretch, the more force for contraction is created. So, since the increased contractility and the increased preload affect the stroke volume, the Frank Starling mechanism will enhance the cardiac output and thus the work of the heart. Next, the reduced cardiac output leads to reduced blood flow to the kidneys, which activates the RA system. The activation of the RA system will lead to vasoconstriction to improve the blood flow, and to fluid retention, which will improve the preload of the heart, which again enhances the contraction of the heart and improves the cardiac output. But the vasoconstriction will also increase the afterload. Also, the reduced cardiac output activates the sympathetic nervous system. Thus, the release sympathetic transmitters by binding to the adrenergic receptors will cause vasoconstriction in attempt to improve the peripheral blood flow, resulting in an increased afterload. Also, will improve the contractility of the heart muscle and also the heart rate. But in the already failing, suffering heart, isn't this too much work to cope with? All this increase in pressures and volumes puts additional strain on the already suffering heart, which in fact, in the long run, harms it even more, worsening the heart failure. The heart's response to this increased stress is myocyte hypertrophy, death and regeneration. As more myocytes die, and increased levels of stress are placed on the remaining myocardium, resulting in worsening the heart failure. Now, from the point of the clinical manifestations, all of these adaptations lead to increased ventricular pressures and volume load, which leads to increase in atrial load, which leads to increased pulmonary load, and at the end, resulting in pulmonary congestion, and peripheral congestion. We know in all means that the patient is literally drowning in the water within the body. Now, the clinical manifestations can be classified into clinical manifestations following left-sided heart failure and clinical manifestations following right-sided heart failure. With left-sided heart failure, we have upward failure and backward failure. The upward failure meaning the symptoms that are a result of low cardiac output, is presented with fatigue, lethargy, dizziness, and exertional dyspnea. 
and backward failure, meaning the blood backs up into the lungs, leading to pulmonary congestion, which is presented with shortness of breath, dyspnea, orthopenia, nocturnal dyspnea, also pulmonary edema, nicturia, and oliguria. This buildup of fluids into the lungs causes crackles as clinical signs that can be detected on auscultation during examination. The causes for left-sided heart failure are many, such as coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, hypertension, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathy, and much more. Now, the causes of right-sided heart failure include left-sided heart failure, which in this case represents biventricular heart failure, chronic pulmonary disease, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary valve stenosis, coronary artery disease, and etc. With left-sided heart failure, the blood backs up into the lungs. But with right-sided heart failure, the blood backs up into the veins of the systemic circulation, leading to peripheral congestion. The backup of fluid into the jugular vein is manifested as jugular vein distension. The backup of fluid into the inferior vena cava and hepatic vein is manifested as congestion of the liver and the spleen, causing hepatosplenomegaly and in long-term cardiac cirrhosis. Then, the buildup of fluid into the peritoneal space, which is called the ascites, and most commonly, because of the effect of the gravity, the buildup of fluid in the lower extremities, which leads to pitting edema, to which the patient often complains as having heavy legs. Shortly, as we mentioned before, the patient is drowning in its own fluid. Okay, so careful evaluation of the patient's history and physical examination, including signs of congestion, can lead us to important information about the underlying cause and eventually to a certain diagnosis. However, other studies and tests that are necessary for patients with heart failure include basic tests such as full blood count, urea and electrolytes, creatinine, liver and thyroid function tests, then levels of B-type natriuretic peptide, which is a substance released by the ventricles, lipids, glycemia, and so on. Then 12-lead ACG to look for an underlying arrhythmias or ischemic events. Transthoracic ultrasonography as the key investigative tool to assess the cardiac function and determine the ejection fraction. Then, chest x-ray to look for signs for pulmonary congestion and cardiomegaly, cardiac MRI, and so on. At the end, after the patient's condition is assessed, we can start with the treatment. The treatment includes a number of non-pharmacologic, pharmacologic and invasive strategies. Non-pharmacologic therapies include dietary sodium and fluid restriction, physical activity and attention to weight gain. Pharmacologic therapies include the use of ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, diuretics, vasodilators, inotropic agents, and so on, according to the type and etiology of the heart failure. The invasive therapies include interventions such as cardioverter defibrillators, cardiac resynchronization therapy, pacemakers, revascularization procedures, wolf replacement, and at the end, heart transplantation. With that, we've come to an end. I hope that this video was helpful for you, and if yes, please make sure to subscribe to support me. Thank you for your time and I hope to see you again.